the global pandemic really accelerated a new era in which hybrid working, and that is from the office, remote or frontline employee, is going to be the norm. Companies will need to ensure that their employees and their people really are supported wherever they are, that they have the right technology and environment so that they can remain connected, but also foster a sense of purpose and belonging at work for their people. Not only is this good for your people, but it makes good business sense. At Workplace, we've identified three rules that provide a framework for leaders to transform employee experience to keep their hybrid teams engaged and help their business stay competitive. The first one is to enable efficient communications. The second is to build community. And the third is to support well-being. What does good well-being look like for employees in 2021? You know, 78% of, uh, of, of, of the workforce uh, say, pan you know, the pandemic has negatively affected their, their mental health. And it's been an incredibly stressful period, you know, but employee well-being, you know, even before the pandemic was, was on the rise in terms of, uh, you know, really being a focus for, for organisations, which is absolutely long overdue. Some of you on the call hopefully will have read uh, this year's Deloitte's Human Capital Trends um, report um, and well-being unsurprisingly is, is a big trend um, for organisations. Studies have really put, uh, have found that putting employee experience, I know we keep coming back to it, but employee experience at the top of your agendas results in a dramatic increase in overall employee well-being because you've really thought through as we say, we keep talking about it, all of the different touch points, all of the different moments of truth within an employee life cycle and how you can enable um, uh, and, and create environments for them to, to thrive. So, you know, when you think about that, you need to think across cultures, you need to think about across geographies, functions, physical and virtual um, workplaces. Uh, and really that there are five core areas that Deloitte called out. The first one was around cultural, right? So building well-being into social behaviors and norms. So Dan was saying it earlier, you're really building it into the DNA of how you operate as an organization. The second one was around relational. So fostering well-being and relationships amongst colleagues. So that comes back to the point we were making around community and really enabling these spaces for people to, to come together, to, to thrive and to learn from each other. Next one is around operational. So, you know, including well-being in management policies, processes and, and, and programs. And that's, you know, of course, has, has needs to be driven by leadership and really building that framework um, into. The fourth one is around physical, you know, designing physical spaces to facilitate well-being. And Dan was talking about it, about, you know, the need to ensure that that's not just for remote workers or office-based workers, but absolutely considers um, frontline um, workers. And the last one, um, is around virtual, you know, designing technologies and virtual workplaces that enable, you know, well-being. So this can be, you know, as simple as ensuring that people have, um, you know, the, the ability to um, have balance, you know, so be able to turn off, do not, you know, put do not disturbs on, um, or, you know, within meeting functionality to, to cut a meeting five minutes short to give five minutes back on, um, on time to be able to suppress notifications um, outside of you know core business hours. You know, we, we've done that at, at Facebook ourselves and the people analytics team at Facebook have found that just by using the, the balance spot that we have internally um, has, has basically uh, seen a trend um, of uh, an upward trend of, um, of work-life of work -life balance scoring more positively for those people that actually use that balance spot. So just even the smallest um, education around how to use technologies um, can really help um, employee wellbeing. But for 2021, it has to be thinking about all of those different elements from, from my perspective. Dan, what about you? How are you thinking about it? Just hearing you talk, and how you describe employee experience, it's almost synonymous with empathy because thinking about employee experience is thinking about other human beings and trying to create an experience end to end throughout their life cycle where, they, where we're taking into account their needs, not just our organizational needs. We as leaders need to create the conditions so people can thrive. There's so much self-help uh, advice out there. Everyone's like, oh, the individual is responsible for their own health and well-being. 
And I'm not going to disagree with it, but I'm going to say it's not solely on the individual. The organization is partially responsible for an individual employee's well-being. And that responsibility, a lot is about the condition. It's not, hey, let's let someone who are paying 40 hours a week work 100 hours a week for the same amount of money because then they're going to be burned out and unhappy. So like having a leader say, okay, after seven o'clock or six o'clock or five o'clock at night, you don't have to respond to emails is basically saying, we care about your well-being. We're creating a condition that you're not going to work until 10 o'clock at night so you have no time for your family. So that's a really key piece that everyone misses in the whole space. They all think, oh, the individual, they need to figure out their own wellness practice and meditate and exercise and eat right. No, 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 no. That's part of it. The other part is how as leaders can we create the conditions, like Abby said, that lead to more positive behavior and people feeling like the organization through, you know, those conditions as well as programs that, you know, support people's physical, mental and emotional health can actually help them. Because if we know people are suffering, it's not just about another program, it's about the conditions and the culture through that employee experience where we're expressing empathy so they can succeed. I, it all, I mean, it's so linked, isn't it? And, you know, every time we sort of talk, it is, it is, you know, it, it just, it flows through without us even thinking about it. You know, it comes back to, to, to empathy. It comes back to, you know, human, humanizing organizations um, and, uh, and, and leadership no longer being, um, I like to use this sort of like the Wizard of Oz you know, bit that sort of like leading behind a curtain, you know, where nobody's actually sort of like seen them, but there's just this voice that every so often sort of like comes out with this sort of like the financial results or anything, you know, that's not what we can do anymore. It should never have been the way personally that the leadership should have, you know, come through. But that's sort of, that authenticity, that, that human um, need, that empathy has to come through the whole of the employee experience, but also recognizing that it doesn't just have to come from leadership, right? You don't have to just be the, the chief exec of the organization or the next low, row down. You know, actually everyone within um, uh, an organization should have a voice and they should be able to impact change. A good idea can come from, from anywhere. We just need to create the environments um, for people to, to really share. Um, I, it was a great example that came through from, from Telefonica, one of our um, uh, European uh, customers and their global uh, chief executive um, posed three questions to the 100,000 employees on, on Workplace last summer, which was, what company do we want to be post-coronavirus? What have we learned? And what are the things do we need to change? And he went out to all of his employees with those three questions. Now, those three questions were probably and absolutely were being asked behind closed doors in a, in a boardroom but the fact that he actually went out and asked those questions and his rationale was really simple you know the problems and the hard times have affected all of us we should also find solutions and and the opportunities together and what i loved about that was he's crowdsourcing for the next strategy um, of the future for, for Telefonica, but he's also showing that vulnerability, right? And he's actually going to drive action from the back of it, which is the vulnerability is, I know I'm the global chief executive, but I don't do every single person's job in this organization. And so therefore I need to hear from you if we're going to actually make a difference together. And that's the empathy as well and building trust on it that, that I think is so important in communities. Thank you, Abby and Dan. I think it will be interesting to hear Dan um, expand on the business case for leadership vulnerability. The business case is very simple. Leaders are struggling more than employees. That's what our data shows. And therefore, if we want employees to bring their full self to work and to be healthy and satisfied with their job, a leader has to go from always thinking that a leader has to be strong by not being vulnerable to strength in vulnerability. And that shift will change the entire organization. Because if a leader says, hey, and this is true, this is like all leaders, you know, hey, I've been burned out, I'm overworked, like I don't know who to rely on right now. I kind of feel stuck. I, there's so much uncertainty. I don't, you know, I have so much pressure by, for instance, shareholders or customers of what to do next or how to handle these situations. Within reason, if you share some of the stuff you're going through, other people who are feeling the same or maybe worse 
can say, okay, yeah, I'm going through this as well. But if they have no one at the top they can relate to, there there's a stigma around mental health. So people are less likely to talk about what they're going through because they don't want to be ostracized. They they want to belong. They don't want to, you know, feel like if if they're talking about how much stress or anxiety they're feeling, like they can get fired because of that. So I think once you start to have the highest levels of the organization be vulnerable, like Abby was saying, then everyone starts to, it, you know, it's like one big giant therapy session, but not in a negative way, in a, hey, let's relate to each other. We're human beings. We're all feeling this right now in one way. And I always tell people when it comes to mental health, you either suffered in the past, you're suffering now, or you'll suffer in the future. Or you know someone or work with someone or sell to someone who has suffered in the past is now or will in the future. So it's every human being in this whole world. This is the, the biggest you know, thing that affects everyone. We have to wrap our heads around it. We have to be more comfortable about it. And it always, it does start with the people who are suffering the most, even though they might be making the most money. And the most money also means the most responsibility and the, 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 it's lonely at the top. So they need to take the first step and saying, hey, things have been very hard for me this year. You know, this happened, that happened, not happened. Please, if anything, take a mental health day or, you know, take a mini vacation, like take an hour off, right? If you need to meditate or exercise, like it's okay. Like I'm going through this and I'm trying to figure this out. And maybe employees might have some good strategies for the executive as well. So we can source good ideas from everywhere and best practices.